I want to welcome everybody this morning. I want to call to order the House Republican Working Group on Economic Recovery. Uh, this was a working group that was put together by Leader John Boehner, uh, calling upon uh, the members of the conference uh, to begin to participate in the battle of ideas uh, about what a potential stimulus package should look like. Uh, Leader Boehner uh, began this process because the President-elect uh, had challenged us uh, to come up with some ideas and to be able to come forward with those and to present to him so that we can uh, show the American people that Washington can work together uh, and to accomplish the tremendous challenge in front of us, which is to get this economy back on track. Uh, so without uh, any further, I would like to call upon Leader John Boehner for opening remarks. Well, Eric, uh, thank you. Let me welcome uh, Governor Romney and, and Ms. Whitman and uh, all of who are attending today. I want to thank Eric, uh, our whip, uh, for putting uh, this hearing together and thank all of the members uh, who have contributed an awful lot of hours over the last several weeks uh, in, in helping to uh, put together uh, our, uh, our package that uh, is still in development. I also want to thank uh, the thousands of Americans uh, who have been participating in this process by leaving their comments at Eric's website, republicanwhip.house.gov. It's no secret that our economy is in, in rough shape. Families and small businesses are in trouble, uh, facing uh, real anxiety about their future. And I think Americans are looking to their elected officials for solutions uh, that will help our economy preserve and create jobs. Uh, Republicans applaud President-elect Obama for his focus on the economy. Uh, he's called on Congress to act on legislation to help put our economy on a path toward recovery, uh, which is what Americans want. And much to his credit, the President-elect has made clear uh, that he wants input on this effort, not just from members of his own party, uh, but from uh, the Republicans and all Americans alike. And such inclusiveness, I think, is essential if we're going to succeed in this process. The American people need to be brought into the process, and we need to pass legislation that reflects their priorities. And many Americans are skeptical uh, of the notion that dramatic increases in government spending on programs and projects uh, will spark economic growth. And contrary to some assertions, more than a few economists are skeptical as well. Uh, they've been sharing their views uh, with us through an Internet project uh, that I launched last month at GOPleader.gov, and I want to thank them for getting involved as well. Identifying effective solutions starts with recognizing that government has been part of the problem. Congress has taken billions uh, of dollars from hardworking families and small businesses and unfortunately wasted it. The troubles in our economy are not the result of a lack of government spending. And there's a real danger that massive spending increases are going to lead to massive tax increases on the American people at some point. And while the need for action, I think, is indisputable, it's equally critical that we do it in a manner that protects the American taxpayer. And I suggested over the weekend that instead of taxing less and spending more, then we might want to think about taxing less and spending less. Novel idea here in Washington. Now, the more new spending we include in this legislation, the more likely it is that taxpayers' money is going to be wasted. And we also need to consider... Uh, the cost that we're passing on to future generations. Are the spending increases temporary or are they permanent? Uh, is there really any such thing as a temporary government spending program? As I said last week on the opening day of this Congress, America's potential is unlimited. Government's potential is not. Uh, the need for action is clear, but we just can't borrow and spend our way back to prosperity. Uh, we need solutions that unleash the job-creating potential of our economy, solutions that encourage investment and job creation, and let American families and small businesses keep more of what they earn. And I think our witnesses uh, today uh, are uniquely qualified to give us some perspective on this. Uh, Governor Romney and Ms. Whitman, I again, once again want to say thank you for taking the time to come here today and all of the other witnesses that we'll have, and, and thank you for sharing your views with us, and I yield back and to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. And again, thank you for uh, convening this work group and uh, for being here today. As the economy sinks further into recession, the American people call out for leadership and bold action.
President-elect Obama correctly recognized last week that the monopoly over strong ideas does not belong to just one party. Today, this panel has gathered together to put forward effective, principled, and time-honored solutions to stimulate the economy. It is our sincere hope that they will be incorporated into a stimulus package that will work its way through Washington. We are fortunate today to have two excellent panels that promise to add a wealth of ideas to the national debate. We begin with Governor Mitt Romney, a man whose economic credentials are nothing short of stellar. Prior to becoming the 70th governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Governor Romney co-founded Bain Capital and engineered the successful turnaround of the 2002 Winter Olympics. And from the state of California, we have former eBay CEO Meg Whitman, who is one of only seven women to have been repeatedly ranked among the world's most influential people by Time Magazine. In our second panel from the American Enterprise Institute, we have the excellent economist and current research fellow Alex Brill. We also have with us this morning Grover Norquist, who's been enormously influential in fighting for lower taxes as president of Americans for Tax Reform. And we have Bill Beach, director of the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation. Bill serves as chief numbers cruncher at Heritage, and we are also grateful for the exceptional research and analysis that he provides to all of us. Our panelists today hail from different parts of the country and cut their teeth in different professions. But we all share a fundamental understanding that the best way to invigorate a weak economy is to provide tax relief to working families and the small businesses they own and work for. At the end of the day, this is about creating good, sustainable jobs. And that's what we're dedicating the full force of our ideas toward. And with that, I would like to recognize the former governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, who's been kind enough to join us today, as was said earlier, uh, for opening remarks. Governor Romney. Thank you so much, Leader Boehner, Congressman Cantor, and uh, so many friends that I see sitting around uh, this, uh, this room. It's an honor to be with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you uh, ideas and options for a stimulus plan. I also appreciate the President-elect's willingness to solicit input from our party. We're, uh, we're committed to working together to strengthen the economy. Now, these are not ordinary times. Yeah, we've had bubbles before, and we've had recessions before. But this was no ordinary bubble, and this is no ordinary recession. This bubble encompassed the largest investment sector of our entire economy, housing. And when it deflated, it didn't evaporate billions but trillions of dollars. The first impact was to see a dramatic reduction in the pool of our investment capital, the capital that sustains small businesses, the capital that finances new enterprises, the capital that promotes education and discovery. This pool of investment capital was held by banks, by investment banks, by institutions, by individuals, and it shrunk by trillions of dollars. Of course, it didn't take long for America's families to feel the impact either. The net worth of American families has shrunk by approximately $11 trillion. That translates into about $400 billion lower annual spending per year. And that $400 billion drop in consumption spending would lead to a deepening downward spiral of business failures and unemployment. More people out of work. Now, exports are going to make up that shortfall because most of the world is also in a recession and because the fear in the currency markets has driven the value of the dollar higher and higher. Investment isn't going to make up that shortfall either because the investment pool of capital has taken such a big hit. What is left is the government sector. Now, there are two ways that Washington can put money back into the economy. One way is to send it back to taxpayers. The other is to spend it itself. Of the two, it's the former giving money back to the taxpayers that has the bigger bang for the buck. Christina Romer, the president-elect's chairwoman of the Council of Economic Advisors, has laid out research that shows that tax cuts have a substantially greater multiplier effect than does spending on infrastructure projects. Tax cuts should be the centerpiece of any, any stimulus plan. The president-elect has proposed refund checks to taxpayers. Now, 
refund checks are nice. And, uh, and there's something which uh, all of us have been in favor of, I'm sure, at one time or another in the past. But evidence shows that a one-time check has very little positive economic influence. The, the 2008 stimulus plan led to checks being sent out, as you know, in May, June, and July of last year. Sure enough, disposable income rose in those months. But as Hoover economist John Taylor has shown, consumption did not rise. Boy, that chart over there is way too small for this audience, but the little, the little tiny blue line at the top shows disposable income of Americans. And you can see this big spike. That's in May, June, and July of last year. Below in red is consumption spending. And there was virtually no increase in consumption spending. We all thought putting that money out there would give us just the boost to keep us from going over the tipping point. But it didn't work because Americans just didn't spend that money, didn't spend that money on those things that would boost the economy. Doing the same thing would be a repeat of the same error. And even if a consumption were to bump up on a temporary basis by sending people back checks, it's not going to lead businesses to expand and add jobs. Business people are smart enough to recognize a one-time, short-lived bump for exactly what it is. The best medicine for a sick economy is permanent tax relief. I'd recommend myself eliminating the tax on savings for middle-income Americans. No tax on interest, dividends, or capital gains. This accomplishes three things. Puts money into the consumer's pocket. It helps replenish the pool of investment capital. And it encourages more Americans to become owners of American business. Now, the same general principles apply to business tax relief as well. A rebate check would be a welcome sight to every business person. Let that be, be said. But a rebate check isn't going to incentivize businesses to expand or to invest for greater productivity or to hire more people. It's lower future tax rates that do that. And there sure is room to cut the corporate tax rate. As you know, we're at the top of the heap when it comes to tax rates, right next to Japan, the nation that's been suffering through a decade-long downturn. In my view, sending out one-time refund checks to consumers and businesses is not the right course. It adds to a monstrous budget deficit without significantly boosting the economy. The right course is permanent tax relief designed to spur growth, investment, and jobs. It should go without saying that raising taxes should be out of the question. It's a positive development, in my view, that the president-elect has chosen not to seek an immediate repeal of the Bush tax cuts. We should go further and seek a permanent extension of the Bush tax cuts, or at the least, a temporary extension. President-elect Obama has also proposed a short-term business incentive to hire new workers. That's not a terrible idea, but it would be less effective, I believe, than allowing businesses to expense capital equipment purchased in the next year or two that would lead them and their suppliers to add employees, and it would boost productivity, raise wages, and improve our competitiveness abroad. Now, the spending portion of the stimulus, if there's going to be such a portion, should be limited to those things which are urgently needed and which we have already planned to buy. Infrastructure projects will be included, of course, but because they invariably face delays for engineering, environmental reviews, and contracting, they can take a long time to actually boost the economy. They should be part of the picture, but they shouldn't be the whole canvas. I'd like to see a significant portion of any new spending to be devoted to the maintenance, repair, replacement, and modernization of our military equipment and armament. Since the 1990s dismantling of the military, we've tended to live off the assets that were purchased in the past. They've been extensively employed in two Gulf Wars and in Afghanistan. Bringing forward needed replacement and repair would boost the economy enhance our national security, and importantly, aid our men and women who are in harm's way. I'd also consider adding spending for energy research and energy infrastructure. Energy independence is, of course, an economic and strategic imperative for our nation. Now, with any new spending on the agenda, I believe that we Republicans should make it clear that this is not to be a parade of pork. All spending projects should be selected by the responsible federal agency according to explicit and publicly disclosed criteria. Republicans, I believe, should commit to vote no on any stimulus bill with earmarks that have not been voted upon by the entire body. Now, I know that cities and states have also been facing some severe financial challenges, 
Some, of course, have built rainy day funds for times just like these. Others haven't. As a governor who welcomed the help you provided to us in the last recession, I won't prescribe zero help for states, but I do believe that it is critical for cities and states to use this time to finally align their spending with their revenues. Now today I think we're rightly focused on the stimulus to stop the economic decline and to end the recession. But we have to be careful. Because if we're not careful, we could add to the risk of something even worse than a recession. If we continue to leverage the public sector, if we continue to pile on more and more debt, if we continue to ignore the looming entitlement liabilities we face, we could precipitate a worldwide collapse of confidence in America, in our currency, in our creditworthiness, in our competitiveness, in our future. We cannot write bailout checks to every petitioner. We cannot spend hundreds of billions of dollars on a laundry list of infrastructure goodies, nor reduce taxes without also reducing government obligations. The ballooning deficits must be balanced with budget restraint and responsibility as the economy recovers. In my view, this stimulus package should include a commitment to reform entitlements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Senator Greg, Greg I believe, is right to propose a bipartisan commission to do just that. He is right, and this is the right time. A stimulus bill combined with a projected $1.2 trillion deficit could send us down the road to ruin if we don't muster the courage to reform entitlements and to rein in government spending. Let me just add one quick thought about regulation. Smart regulation is good. Dumb regulation is bad. Housing finance is one of the most highly regulated sectors of our economy. And yet no one's going to claim that the regulation was very smart. Yes, we need to improve regulation in housing and in financial services. But the right course is to make the regulation we have effective. Smart regulation will make these sectors more productive and more competitive. Simply layering on burdensome regulatory schemes would depress those industries, kill more jobs, and slower economic recovery. Now, one more thing. There is one very bad idea that's being promoted by a special interest group. It's an idea that would have a devastating impact on the economy, short-term and long-term. It would lead investors to send their funds elsewhere, businesses to expand elsewhere, and jobs to relocate elsewhere. It is a plan to virtually impose unions on all small, medium, and large businesses by removing the right of workers to vote by secret ballot. Card check is a very bad idea under any circumstances. And in these circumstances, it would be calamitous. In some, we're presented with an economic peril unlike anything we face during our lifetimes. I do believe that careful, skillfully crafted stimulus can improve the prospects for, for, for recovery. But excessive and sloppy spending and one-time refund checks could have exactly the opposite effect than that which the stimulus seeks. And in the final analysis, we have to remember that it's the private sector, the home of entrepreneurs, of workers, of managers, of visionaries, the private sector, not the government sector, that creates jobs, boosts wages, and provides for our future. And what gives me my confidence in our future is simply this. I believe in the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governor, thank you very much for those remarks. Next up, we will turn to Meg Whitman, again, the former CEO of eBay, anxiously awaits your statement. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Cantor, Leader Boehner. Thank you for all of you for giving me the opportunity to meet with you today. It's a privilege to be testifying with my good friend and former colleague, Mitt Romney. And I commend you for hosting this discussion on issues of overwhelming importance to our nation, restoring growth and prosperity to the American economy, creating sustainable, well-paying jobs, and helping Americans achieve a sense of security again. The economic crisis we face is extraordinary in its reach and scope. The recession has touched just about everyone. Unemployment is rising, people are losing their homes, 
the stock market is falling, the economy is contracting, and the deficit is exploding. In my home state, for example, California faces a budget deficit over two years of more than $40 billion, and unemployment has reached 8.4 percent, the third highest in the nation. And both may get worse before they get better. There is urgency for us to act, and, but things need to be done, but they need, and they need to be done quickly. But they also need to be done carefully, intelligently, and with the transparency and accountability that every citizen of the United States has a right to expect. In the short time we have today, I will confine my comments to the stimulus plan. And in my opinion, every dollar we spend and every program we pursue should be measured against three basic objectives. Objective number one, or criteria number one, is does it create sustainable jobs? That has to be the lens through which we view virtually every policy decision. Second, how effectively does each initiative help the middle class and the majority of hardworking Americans? And finally, are we spending every dollar as effectively as possible to meet those two major goals? We are pouring billions of dollars of taxpayers' hard-earned money into the economy. The people in California and throughout the nation are right to insist on results. Now let me, um, let me uh, emphasize here that I think there's a number of things going on. Since the mid-1990s, for example, small business has created over 70 percent of all new jobs in America. And any sensible recovery plan needs to focus on, fo on small business. Now this is an area that I know something about. I have spent my entire professional career building businesses. I joined eBay in 1998, for example, when the company had 30 employees, $4.7 million in revenues, and 300,000 registered users, mostly in the United States. Today, eBay has operations in 38 countries, employs some 15,000 people, and generates close to $8 billion in revenue. Most remarkably, some 1.3 million people make most, if not all, of their living selling on eBay. And when a small business grows like eBay did, it has a multiplier effect. It creates other small businesses that supply it with intellectual capital, goods, and services. Now, the current plan has a couple of valuable measures to support business growth by allowing companies to write off losses in 2008 and 2009, going back five years, and provide tax credits for companies that make new hires. And this is good as far as it goes, but there is so much more that needs to be done. In my judgment, we have to avoid, at all costs, tax increases. That would be the worst possible thing to do and would make a bad economy even worse. Beyond that, targeted tax relief should be expanded upon. We need to make permanent the R&D tax credit, which is especially important to technology-oriented companies, which has been the growth engine for California and many tech-oriented states, like Virginia. Small businesses must also have access to capital through lending. Today, there is virtually no lending to small businesses, and this is crushing their ability to grow. A small business lending plan could be administered through the Small Business Administration in partnership with the private sector banking community. We should also ensure that banks that get federal support lend to small business. We also need to reduce corporate taxes. This applies to small, medium, and large businesses. At 35 percent, as Mitt said, we have the second highest business tax rate in the world. It restricts the growth of small enterprises that need to plow capital back into their businesses and forces companies and jobs to move overseas. Now, let me briefly turn to the ways I think we can help the middle class. Permanent reductions in marginal tax rates for the middle class will have a much greater positive impact than just providing refundable tax credits. We have learned time and again that refunds alone do very little to stimulate the economy and improve people's economic lives unless they are coupled with permanent tax cuts. We should also not raise any personal or investment tax rate. At is exactly at exactly the wrong time, it will hurt our workforce and the companies that employ us. And to help those most in need, in addition to extending unemployment benefits, we should simply eliminate taxing these benefits once and for all. We also need to help our retirees who've lost a great deal of their savings, 
many of whom have no hope of reentering the workforce. We should temporarily make all withdrawals from IRAs not subject to taxation and penalties for at least 2000 beyond, 2009 and possibly beyond that. Let me turn finally to the matter of infrastructure investments. There are sound initiatives that have been discussed, like my personal favorite, broadband ubiquity to every household in America, a new power grid, green technologies, and much needed repair to bridges and tunnels. But this is not a stimulus plan. And if these programs are not shovel ready, if they are not shovel ready, they're not going to be stimulus ready and therefore may or may not be helpful over the long term. We need to get people to work and we should dedicate part of the infrastructure spending to energy conservation, resource conservation, and immediately rebuilding the military through equipment and training investment. Programs like this will get capital into the system rapidly and serve a real need. The military in particular has been stretched thin by two ongoing wars, wars and it needs immediate assistance. The military is the branch of government that's performing well, perhaps even heroically, and it has earned our support. And of critical importance to everyone, particularly the taxpayer, we need to ensure that our money is being spent wisely. It is inconceivable to me that there has not been more oversight on the hundreds of billions of dollars that have already been spent in recent months. There must be goals established for each stimulus program, and progress must be tracked, measured, and reported back to the American people. We need to demand transparency and accountability rather than merely giving it lip service. The challenges we face should not be underestimated. At the same time, we have the most talented, resourceful, and resilient nation in the world. Our workforce is second to none. And we have overcome larger challenges than we face today. And what is required to meet the economic, of our ch of economic challenges of our time is no mystery. We know what works. We know how to create jobs, economic growth, and prosperity. It is a matter of putting the right program in place. And I know that is what each of you is seeking to do. And I am committed to do everything in my power to assist you. So thank you very much for your time this morning. And I look forward to your questions and to your comments. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Whitman. Uh, today, we're going to have questions from both the members of the working group as well as some that have been submitted by our constituents. And to the members of the working group, we're going to do questioning a bit differently today. Uh, unlike the formal standing committees, we will just ask you to seek recognition. Uh, but to get us started with the first question, I'd like to recognize uh, the chairman of our Republican conference from Indiana, Mike Pence. Thank you, Congressman Cantor. Thanks for your outstanding leadership on this issue and, and, and that of all the members of the Republican working group. I'm especially grateful to have the chance to uh, welcome these two distinguished witnesses, uh, great Americans. Thank you for your thoughtful and challenging comments this morning and for your time and attention. Let me say on behalf of my colleagues, as both of you have said, Republicans in Congress know the American people are hurting. Many Americans have lost their jobs. Many more millions are worried that they might be next. And like both of you have done, uh, we're grateful that our incoming president has requested Republican ideas in the development of a stimulus bill. But like most Americans, House Republicans know we can't borrow and spend and bail our way back to a growing economy. And so this hearing and, and your comments are enormously valuable. My question would be this, simply. Uh, uh, Governor Romney, you said, and I quote, the best medicine is permanent tax relief. Ms. Whitman, you just said that the permanent reductions uh, in marginal rates uh, for the middle class would be most effective. Um, Republicans agree with this in the main, but as this working group goes forward, uh, let me ask this question to both of you. If we were to consider permanent marginal tax reductions as an element of our plan, which rates are, in your judgments, most important to reduce in order to alleviate the burden on working men and women and create middle-class entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. Specifically, uh, Governor Romney, to use your phrase, where do we get in marginal rates the biggest bang for the buck for middle-class Americans in these troubled times? 
Well, you know, there, there's such a, um, uh, a difference in perspective. I think a lot of folks think that if government just goes out and buys a lot of stuff, that's going to get the economy going. And it's just, it, it's like, you know, throwing a little gasoline in a fire. It gets a, a little burst, but it doesn't have a sustained effect. Right. What you want to do is create incentives for the private sector to do things that creates uh, new jobs and, and, and that allows the private sector to grow. That's where permanent jobs come from. Every dollar that we have to spend in this country represents a good or service produced in the private sector. So you want, to, you want more dollars for the American people, you want more jobs, you want more expansion, you've got to grow the private sector. So we look at tax policy that creates incentives for people to do things that cause growth or that either through invention or through business or through business expansion. Now, what are the things that, that create growth? Well, one, of course, is allowing people to keep more of their money so they buy things. Another is incentives to save money. I happen to, to think that one of the things I'd like to see doesn't cost a lot of money, but in terms of the tax effect that, that I think could have one of the most positive effects is to say, you know what, people earning under $200,000 a year, families earning under $200,000 a year, you can be able to save your money and don't pay taxes on your savings. Take your, whatever you earn from the sale of a property, from the sale of a stock, uh, interest from the bank that you get, you don't pay tax on it. Makes your taxes a lot simpler. No tax on interest, dividends, capital gains, no tax on that. For middle income folks, that takes money and puts it back into the pool of investment capital, which allows businesses to have the capital to grow and thrive. It lets Americans keep more of their own money. It encourages us to save more, which is something we've desperately needed. I'm, uh, I'm of the view that that's one of the tax, that's one of the tax, permanent tax reductions I think can have a very significant effect. And it's not real expensive, if you will, from a, uh, from a national uh, revenue standpoint. Because the, most of the capital gains, interest and dividends, are being paid by people who are earning well in excess of $200,000 a year. And of course, you know, it's, it's always the top marginal rates. I'd like to see rates cut across the board, top, middle, and bottom for the American people so that there's more incentive to, to, uh, to earn, to stay into the workforce, and to keep, uh, to keep working, uh, and, to, and to make the investments necessary to create new jobs. I think economists will tell you that capital gains, that the tax on savings, capital gains, interest, and dividends, however, has the most positive effect. It, reducing that tax has the most positive effect on growth and expansion. I would say the most important thing to think about is how do we um, actually help small businesses grow? And so I would say the number one thing I would look at for this group is to say, can we bring down business tax rates for small business? Because particularly in these economic times, businesses are struggling to hire people. They're struggling not to lay off people. They're struggling to stay afloat. And as you know, we have the highest business tax rate in the world. We take one-third of all business profits. And many small businesses, of course, the owners pay at an individual income tax rate. And they pay a, a very high rate as well. So this notion of trying to work on the business tax rates as well as the tax rates for middle-class Americans, I think, is the place to start, particularly in these economic times. I don't disagree with Mitt on the investment income, but right now there's not a tremendous amount of investment income out there. Um, and, uh, and so I would start with the corporate tax rates and the middle income um, tax rates to, to take relief where we need it the most. Thank, thank, thank both of you, and thank you, Chairman Pence. Uh, at this point, we, we, as was said before, we've done something a little differently this time, and we've solicited online questions from our constituents. They've been asked to submit videos. And uh, we would like to uh, play for you one of those at this point for a constituent to pose a question. Our first my name is Pam Jones. My husband Paul and I own two small businesses here in Rutledge, Georgia. I own an antique shop and my husband owns a hardware store next door. We've been in business here in Georgia for 29 years. We've been through good times and bad. and. We are very concerned about this economic stimulus package, the economy in general, retail business, and what's going to happen to us in this new administration. Uh, please try to come up with another way, something that will help all business, and something that will help small business, which is the backbone of America. Thank you for your time. Thank you, panelists. Why don't I Go take ahead. that one okay. uh, first? Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for that question. And I think um, Pam is the embodiment of small business in the United States with her and her husband owning side-by-side -side small businesses. So I would reiterate what I said about the tax rates for small businesses. 
But you know what else is going on in this economy? This um, recession has turned into a consumer-led economy, which is quite different than what we saw at the dot-com bubble burst in 2001, what we saw in 1997 and back in 1987, which was mostly business-led recession. Today, you can see consumers pulling back at every turn. I mean, think about your own behavior. Think about your neighbor's behavior. People are eating out less. They're shopping less. And a 10% pullback in consumer spending is tremendously detrimental to people like Pam and her husband. So again, I would argue, how do you make these tax cuts for people like Pam and her husband permanent? And the reason that permanent tax cuts are so important is people can plan around it. A stimulus check, you don't know with how, exactly how much you're going to get. You don't know if you'll get another one. These payroll tax deductions that I think the, stim the current um, stimulus plan by the president-elect talks about, very hard to administer, very hard for individuals to actually know, how much will I get back? And so I would argue that permanency and clarity around these tax cuts for people like Pam and her husband are the way to think about this. Yeah, what I'd like to do for Pam and Paul is get more people into their stores, more people buying antiques, more people buying hardware goods. And how are we going to get more people in their stores? And that's having more people look to the future and think it's going to be bright. It's going to be having businesses or stories in the journal and the New York Times and the Post and other journals indicating that their companies are adding jobs. Those things happen. Psychology changes and we get more people out there shopping and we have more people earning income, so we get more people in their stores. That's what we want to have happen. So the people don't have to worry about the future, but they're excited about the future. For that to happen, it's not going to be by just sending out a check from government, because they know that that check is written on their own bank account for the future, that someone's going to pay for that, and that's going to be them as they pay back the debt down the road. It doesn't get people to go out and spend, as we just saw with the 2008 stimulus bill. We all thought that sending that money out would get people to spend. It didn't. They recognized it for what it was. So did businesses. You want to get businesses to have the incentive to make investment to grow. They have to see something that's not just a one-time occurrence, but that it's a permanent occurrence. And that's why permanent tax relief is so important for the private sector, in homes and in businesses. Permanent tax relief changes incentives, encourages people to make investment, to add jobs. That's how we get more people in that antique shop. That's how we get more people in that retail hardware store. Thank you both. At this time, I want to turn to the ranking member on the Budget Committee, gentleman from Wisconsin, Paul Ryan. Thank you, and welcome to the Budget Committee. It's great to have you here with us today. Um, we've been watching press reports on the size of this stimulus package. Last year, it started at $60 billion. Then rumors in October it was going to be $300 billion. Last week, $775 billion. This morning, we're hearing it's $850 billion. And, and the thing we're looking at is we hear most of this stimulus submission that we're going to receive maybe next week, and we may be marking it up next week and voting it on the next week, it's about a third of our budget, uh, maybe on the spending side. And so we all know that not all spending is equal, and we went into this. Um, creating the interstate highway system, which took about 15 years, made America much more productive, much more efficient, but repaving the interstate highway system does not reachieve those kinds of efficiency gains. It just makes the road a little smoother. So if we're going to do fiscal policy, I think we're here talking about tax policy. And so I want to ask you um, to go a little bit more specific in the tax policy arena. The Congressional Budget Office earlier this week just gave us their report, their latest assessment of the economy. They're telling us that the uh, unemployment rate they believe for this year is going to be 8.3%. The unemployment rate for next year, 2010, will be 9%. The unemployment rate in 2011 will be 8%. The unemployment rate in 2012, 6.8%. High unemployment millions of jobs lost. We are the people's house. We are the ones who are with our constituents every single week who see the human suffering of a great recession like the one we're experiencing right now. And our concern is that if we do a big spending package right now, which takes a long time to spend, the Congressional Budget Office is also telling us these kinds of spending ideas, only 27 percent of the spending actually goes out the door in the first year. That means 73 percent of the spending goes out year two, three, four, and there on after. And so the concern we have is that if we have all this new spending right now, it will actually guarantee much higher taxes just after next year, when we still have an 8 percent unemployment rate, according to the Congressional Budget Office. And so we're fearful that we're going to whipsaw ourselves with much higher taxes at the very time we're hopeful the economy pulls out of it. 
And so while we understand permanent tax rates are important, should we go further than simply not allowing these tax increases to incur? Right now, the top tax rate on small businesses is 35 percent. The top tax rate on corporations, C-Corps, is 35 percent, the second highest in the world. Governor Rami, a question to you. What rate would you put the corporate tax rate? Um, Ms. Whitman, question to you. What rate would you put that small business tax rate? Because as we all know, two-thirds of those who file the top income tax are small businesses, right. not, not just wealthy people, but small businesses. And so what is the ideal tax rate that we should achieve and therefore make permanent uh, in this kind of environment? And the last question is, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty in the economy. That's one of the biggest things we need to attack. Do you believe that this notion of all these tax increases after, at the end of this session of Congress, precipitated by all this new spending, is already dampening the economy? Do you believe that the notion and the fact that current law says these tax rates are going up on capital gains, on dividends, on incomes, is that hurting us right now? Should, it, should we say right now we will have no tax increases for at least the next four years, and would that in and of itself produce a stimulus? Well, first of all, uh, you, you mentioned scale and, and what's the sc scale of what needs to be done. Um, the $11 trillion reduction in net worth of the American families translates into about net, net of the government safety net programs that, that grow automatically, about $400 billion less in annual spending. So that the ceiling you'd look at would be roughly $400 billion, not $700, $800, $900 billion. So it's a much lower number in terms of, of what might be needed to plug that gap, if that's the, if that's the figure that you're focused on. Number two, the, uh, you know, I'd like to see a much lower rate. I'd like to see us have a rate which is competitive with the nations of Europe and the rest of the world. And that's a rate that's much closer to 25 than it is to 35. Now, that, that may not be politically achievable at the current time, but, but that, that's the kind of rate that, that would make America competitive with other nations. We'd at the same time eliminate some of the loopholes and some of the special breaks that have been placed in over the years um, and, and simplify our system. But the combination of simplification, taking out the loopholes and setting a rate that's more competitive would, uh, would be extraordinarily stimulative and would also make us more competitive on a global basis. Now, of course, the individual rates are going to have to be consistent with the corporate rate because you have sub S corporations and LLCs as long as well as C corps and so you're going to have to have harmony between the two rates but bringing down tax rates without on a permanent basis basis without question changes the incentives of investors and encourages people to invest here rather than take their dollars and take their jobs and go elsewhere so lowering our tax rates so they're not the highest in the world along with Japan but instead that they're more in line with the nations of Europe makes a lot of sense. Germany's been doing this. France has been doing this. Ireland, as you know, has done it long, long ago. And, and our rates are, are frankly out of line. I do agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that, that, the, that the prospect of a substantial increase in the capital gains tax rate and new penalties on investment have, uh, have tended to chill the market and have made it, when I say the market, the, the, the pool of investment capital is, is frightened and is, and is withdrawn. And that, of course, kills jobs and indicating once and for all that we're either going to extend permanently the tax rates that you've established in the past or we're going to extend them at least temporarily during these tough economic times would have a very positive effect on economic growth. I would make a couple of comments. First, the scale of what is being talked about is actually breathtaking. One trillion dollars. I'm not sure how many Americans actually can contemplate how much one trillion dollars is. I mean, one trillion dollars is three thousand four hundred dollars for every man, woman, and child in America. If that one trillion dollars was to be spent to create four million jobs, that's a cost of two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars per job created. So I think you are wise to really think exactly what is the spending that is going to be required to um, try to pull us out of this recession, um, because this is a breathtaking amount of money. And you know what? It is what I call other people's money, or OPM. And I just think it's very important to remember that $1 trillion is hardworking Americans' money that, uh, that we're trying to scoop up to deploy in, in a way that really needs to work. The second thing I would agree with Mitt, I think the, um, the business tax rates need to be closer to 25 percent, which would put us about in the middle of the pack in terms of competitive countries. So plus or minus 25 percent I think is, an, is, a, is a way that you should be thinking about that. 
With regard to certainty, I do think that there's a number of things in this economy that are um, creating uncertainty. One is what will the tax rates be? I think another one is when will lending actually start again, particularly to small businesses. So to the extent that you can require or insist upon the banks that have received federal money actually go ahead and start to lend to small businesses would make a huge difference. So it's a little bit like a dam. When you finally get the water coming through, all of a sudden maybe you'll see more of the floodgates open, which will actually grease the system a little bit and really help small businesses. I think the third thing that I would say is around certainty beyond lending is a confidence that we will come out of this um, by the right programs targeted towards the right people will actually give the Americans confidence. And so I think, you know, ultimately a united Congress behind the right plan um, will actually give Americans tremendous amount of confidence. And so I would encourage the Congress broadly to get together and move swiftly because time is not on our side here. And there is what we call fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD, that has started to work its way into the system over a long period of time. And the sooner that you can get to clarity as a body, I think will be tremendously helpful to individuals and to small businesses. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, at this time, I want to turn to uh, yet another question from the citizens of this country. Uh, this citizen happens to be a constituent of Congressman Denny Reberg from Montana. His name is Steve of Oak Creek, Montana. Greetings from Oak Creek, Montana. My name is Steve, and I'd like to thank Congressman Cantor and the staff at Congressman Reberg's office for the opportunity to get my voice heard in the Capitol this week this whole uh, thing in the, the bailout for uh, President-elect Obama. Uh, my suggestion would be to um, put in some wording to elect some programs that would you know, help people get into the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, create their own businesses and enterprises that are more sustainable. Uh, we can create more jobs, and it'll help our generation. We look at the statistics that have been thrown around that Social Security will run out in the near future, that um, the baby boom generation will wipe it out. Our generation won't have any type of uh, ability to, to compete with that. We need to, uh, we need more than a paycheck in our pocket at one time. We need, you know, sustainable thing that, that we can create our own jobs and, and create jobs for others. Thank you. Thank you. And Congressman Rebert, thanks for your constituents' input. Any comments? Well, I agree with Steve. I mean, wealth is created by inspired individuals. Wealth is not created by the government. And it is individuals like Steve who evidently have an entrepreneurial drive, who want to start their own business, who need help um, to and encouragement to start their own businesses. And, um, and so I would say that, again, a lot of the things that we've talked about, um, particularly lending, if you're Steve and you want to start a new business, unless you happen to have capital on your own, you're going to need some help to get started, to buy inventory, to lease space, to start an Internet business. You can start small, but you need some help to get going. So I would argue this notion of unfreezing lending, encouraging people like Steve through some kind of a partnership through the SBA and the corporate lenders may be a very good place to start. You know, Steve said something that um, he said a lot of things were, that were often smart, but he said something I hope we, uh, we give some thought to, and that is he, he said uh, concern about Medicare, Social Security down the road, and will it be there? You know, that's a cloud that's hanging over a lot of people that are, that are working today, which is the common held belief that this safety net, this entitlement future for retirees may be in jeopardy. And that's because they read correctly that these programs are not sustainable the way they're in place. I, I really believe it's essential that we include in our discussion of stimulus a commitment to resolve the massive liabilities associated with entitlement programs that, that are no longer sustainable on a, on a permanent basis. And, uh, and that's why I, I, I do believe it's essential that we, that we indicate a commitment to reform these major, these major entitlement programs. I think doing so has the prospect of encouraging a lot of people about their economic future. I, uh, I agree with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Meg Whitman. We're on the same page with regards to the, uh, the, uh, the, the benefits for entrepreneurs uh, of boosting the pool of investment capital uh, and the benefit to workers across this country of seeing job growth through permanent tax reductions. 
Thank you both. And uh, I'm going to encourage the members of the work group to try and condense your questions so we can get through as many as we possibly can. Next up is uh, Kevin Brady. He is a ranking member on the Joint Economic Committee from Houston, Texas. Eric, thank you for hosting this and appreciate you reaching out to, to average Americans to ask their opinions. I think there's been too little of that done as the stimulus package has been shaped. We're all, we're all shaped by our own experiences. Clearly, our two panelists are. I was a Chamber of Commerce manager before coming to Congress, so basically our life was working with small businesses, both to survive during tough times and to create jobs during uh, better economic times. And, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. Small businesses and families can smell a gimmick 100 miles away. That's why they're holding their money. That's why they're not making those investments. And those long-term solutions that you propose are really, I think, the, the better idea we need to be proposing uh, to our new president. And I do agree, too, there's an appalling lack of confidence in Wall Street, uh, in the bailout plan so far, uh, and in Congress to deal with uh, this issue, which is why your presence uh, here, Governor, and Ms. Whitman are so important. Question for you, following up with what Paul Ryan said, because you're out of the beltway, is this free money that we're talking about here? You know, I ask that because there's almost that perception that this is a free money giveaway. We're experiencing sort of a second great American gold rush these days, all of it to Washington, hands out looking for dollars in the stimulus. But it seems to me the consequences of this mass suspending uh, effort is, one, eventually our need to uh, finance this debt will squeeze out private investment uh, for the very type of infrastructure and other pro projects we need. And secondly, this has to lead to higher tax uh, rates. I serve on the Ways and Means Committee. You cannot simply soak the wealthy in order to pay for this trillion dollars of costs. Um, it's going to raise taxes somewhere on business, on small businesses, on families. I'd like to ask you, because you're both of you, since you're out of the outside the Beltway, is this free money we're dealing with right now? Congressman. Uh you, you remind me of an experience I had when I was out helping organize the Olympic Winter Games in 2002. I was at the top of a mountain uh, near Ogden, Utah, a place called Snow Basin, and, and I was looking down the ski slope. It was like the knife of a mountain. I was just at the very top. I was looking down the ski slope and wondering how in the world I was going to get down that mountain, how dangerous it would be to fall down that mountain. And then someone said, look the other way. And I turned the other way, and it was even steeper the other way. <laughs> now, we're like walking along the knife of a mountain. And we're looking at this recession that we're in and the downturn, and we're saying, what things can we do to fix this downturn? But we can't forget that there's the other side of the mountain, which is if we take action that's precipitous and we spend money unwisely and throw it around in programs that don't make a lot of sense and put together a, a parade of pork, why, we could find ourselves in much bigger trouble, not just from the current recession, but from a collapse of confidence, from loss of capital for our businesses, from, uh, from uh, uh, other nations withdrawing their interest in purchasing our debt, seeing our currency become worthless. I mean, I don't want to be too frightful here, but, but you can't just say, oh, we've got a problem. Let's just spend all the money in the world and solve it. Because if you spend too much and you spend it unwisely, we could cause something even worse. There is no free money here right now, given all that's been spent in the past, all the deficits, the one point two trillion dollar deficit that we're looking at going forward the trillions of dollars of unfunded liability through our entitlements. We can't afford to just keep on adding debt. At some point, we're going to reach that tipping point. I don't know where it is, but I don't think it's a far, far way down the road. We're going to have to deal with this excessive spending, and we cannot continue to put out money like it's free. It's not, and we stand the risk of going off the other side of this mountain knife, if you will and finding ourselves in, in troubles which are not a year or two of a recession, but a very, very long and painful economic circumstance. And, uh, and that's why I think it's so critical that, that the president-elect um, listen very carefully to the voices that come from this room, your voices, in crafting legislation that will actually stimulate the economy and not just do a lot of friends' political favors. Right. Thank you, Governor. There obviously is no, this is not free money. And it is not only the, the people in this room who understand that, 
But when I am out and about talking to average Americans, which is almost every day now, um, they understand that this is not free money. I know most of you probably your mail and email on the first bailout was probably running 300 to 400 to 1 against that bailout. And the reason is average Americans understand where this money is coming from. It's actually their money. And they also understand debt. Individuals understand that when they take on debt to buy appliances or buy a car, they have to pay that money back. And they know how hard it is to pay that money back. And they know how much sacrifice is going to be involved in paying that money back. So I, I think people do understand that there is no such thing as free money, printed money, that you know, someday someone is going to have to pay back. And so I would just be very strong in your voice for the average American who understands that the debt per person in the United States is now as high as it has ever been in recent memory. And average individuals understand that debt is a very tough thing to work your way out of. And uh, so I think the question is well asked. There isn't any free money here, and someday someone's going to have to pay this all back. Right. Now, if the stimulus is focused on creating jobs, to me that is sustainable economic growth, because if we can grow the GDP faster, then revenue rises even at lower tax rates. And that is ultimately the situation we'd like to find ourselves in, higher revenues at lower tax rates because we're growing the economy and we're growing sustainable, productive jobs. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon uh, one of our newest members of our conference uh, from the city of New Orleans, uh, Ann Gao. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Congressman Cantor and the um, Republican leadership for this hearing. I'd like to thank the governor and Ms. Whitman for being here today. Uh, after hearing both of you today, I, I, I hear that we have to change the American psychology and to somehow encourage people to spend, I'd like to ask you a question of how the tax cuts will encourage people to spend when the economy is so bad and whether or not the tax cut proposal will be a fast enough tool to stimulate the economy. Um, I, nobody, okay. okay. Um, I don't know that it's, it's so much that we want to encourage people to spend is that we want people to have confidence in the future. And when people have confidence in the future, they spend at a normal rate. We really don't want people to go out and borrow to the hilt again. Over-borrowing is what got us in trouble in the first place. So uh, we're, we're not going to say to people, here, get this check, go out and spend it. That, that, just, that does not create the kind of economic growth that I think you and I and all of us are looking for. Instead, having people understand that by in improving our pool of investment capital, allowing businesses to grow and add jobs, more people see employment numbers coming out that are positive. We see uh, in entitlements being reformed and on a sustainable basis. You'll give confidence back to the American people, and they'll, they'll not be fearful in withdrawing the more normal level of spending, but will instead return to the level of spending which has allowed our economy to be successful in the past. Make the, the, the tough decision to decide to let's say, leave a long-term job and start a business, more entrepreneurship. My guess is that if you if you looked at the number of job, or business creations and entrepreneurships right now, people are afraid, and so they're holding back. We want to remove fear, replace it with enthusiasm and prospects of, of prosperity. And I think doing that occurs when you allow people to keep more of their income, you allow businesses to keep more of their income, and encourage them to make the investments which create jobs. I would say the number one thing that, that this group could do to restore confidence is move that unemployment rate in the right direction sooner. One of the members mentioned 8.3%, 9%, then back to 8%. To the extent that we can move that employment rate in the right direction faster will give people confidence because everyone is very nervous about losing their job. And I think one of the reasons that you see people pulling in their spending, not going out to dinner, being very careful how they spend their money, is they're terribly worried they may be the next one in line at their company or small business to lose their job. So that's why I come back to the very first criteria for everything related to the stimulus plan. Does it create jobs or does it stop the loss of jobs? And if you view that policy, if you view job creation as the number one lens through which you view everything around the stimulus package, that may have the nearest effect in terms of turning this economy around. Because if we can get some of the numbers going in the right direction, then people get confidence. Then numbers go in a little bit more of the right direction. People get confidence. Business is higher. People go out and spend wisely, not irrationally, but wisely. 
And that's how you have to turn this economy, in my view. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question for this panel, and then we'll ask the panelists to make some closing remarks. This time I want to call upon uh, another one of our freshman members uh, from Buffalo, New York, Chris Lee. Thank you, Chairman. As a fellow businessman who got to Washington based on a manufacturing background and people identified that uh, when you run a small business how difficult it is, but I truly understand that it is small business that creates the jobs in this country and our energies really need to be focused on any incentives we can do to help small business because a 10,000 small businesses each hiring 30 people is a huge number and it's, those are the areas that you have to keep focusing on and how to help them. And one point that came up recently is one type of tax cut currently being considered for inclusion in the stimulus package is the net operating loss carry back. And this provision would give small businesses access to much needed capital by using losses in the current year to offset tax liabilities as many as five years ago. Democrats are currently considering taking this provision out of the final bill. And I would appreciate your your thoughts. Do you believe this would be a mistake? And what kind of impact do you believe this would have on small business? Yes, I think it would be a terrible mistake. And I was sorry to hear a couple of days ago that the Democrats were thinking about taking this out. I actually think this has real, meaningful benefit for small businesses. Small business understand exactly what this will mean to their current year cash flow, which gives them the confidence to either keep people on the payroll or hire new people. So I am sorry to see if that goes out. I think you all should try to fight for that. I'm a big believer in manufacturing jobs. I uh, appreciate the fact that, uh, that, that you uh, come from that sector. Uh, I think there's a, a view in this country that, that uh, manufacturing can be done more effectively elsewhere and that we're going to become a service economy. We've we got a lot of service uh, economy, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing as a nation, but, um, uh, but we need manufacturing. And, uh, and, I, and I believe that, that we should attempt to tailor uh, some of our, um, our tax policy uh, toward encouraging manufacturing. I won't take a complete diversion, but the embedded taxes we have in manufactured goods make our goods non-competitive here in many cases and non-competitive around the world. That's something outside the stimulus bill, but I, I do believe that, that policy that encourages manufacturing and puts us on a level playing field is very badly needed. Um, at, at the same time, uh, helping small business uh, is something which I would certainly uh, think ought to be the focus of what we're considering in this stimulus bill allowing uh, tax loss uh, carry back uh, is, is certainly one way of doing that as you, as you know I also uh, I also believe that uh, we are we are wise to get the corporate rate down both for sub s corporations LLCs and C corporations which allows businesses to keep more of their earnings and uh, and that I think would be also a productive way to encourage the development and growth of new jobs the other thing I would look carefully at, um, which was in the original stimulus program, which may be in jeopardy as well, is this notion for a tax credit for new hires. Um, and so the way I would be thinking about this as a business person is net new hires. How many people can you hire versus how many people get laid off? And so a notion around a tax credit for net new hires, i.e. an incentive to grow your business, might exactly influence the key statistic I was talking about, which is where is unemployment going, and might be a quite an effective short-term um, stimulus to help businesses stop laying off and, uh, and actually hire people because there's a financial incentive to do it in the near term. First of all, I want to thank you on behalf of the members of the committee very much for being here. Your comments were extremely insightful. Uh, and obviously, from your personal backgrounds, you bring a lot of credibility uh, to, to your remarks. And we thank you. And we'd just like to invite uh, both of you if you have any closing remarks. Ms. Whitman. Well, thank you very much for, for having, and thank you very much for asking. I think um, both Mitt and I appreciate being invited, and we really appreciate the leadership that everyone on this team is showing in terms of trying to work towards um, a stimulus package that will truly benefit the American economy. And I would just reiterate where I started. I think um, in, in business and in life, prioritization and a focus is incredibly important. So if all the efforts can, first of all, uh, first of all be focused on does the initiatives, does the stimulus plan help create new sustainable jobs? Are they targeted towards the middle class and hardworking families? And are we administering these programs in a way 
that if every one of your constituencies could see how much the program cost, what was the milestones, what was the timetable, and what were the actual benefits, you would be proud to show those results to every American in your district. So thank you for, for inviting us. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the chance to be here as well and to, uh, to sit next to my friend Meg Whitman. Uh, and she is a person of remarkable accomplishment, and her advice, I think, is, uh, is very, very good. I'm also pleased that the President-elect has, uh, has solicited the input of our party. I, I think the, uh, the rhetoric of the new administration uh, has been good with regards to its willingness to be open to input. Uh, I think we should make clear to the President-elect that we are open to compromise, but that we cannot in good conscience, as part of this effort, do anything that would hurt the American people, do anything that would uh, uh, hurt the economy in the name of stimulus if it actually is only an effort to expand the power of government. It's important for us to stand for principle, to do what's right for the people, to do what's right to grow jobs, to grow the economy, but not just to, uh, to participate in something for the name of compromise that, uh, that would not provide for a brighter future for the American people. And I, uh, I appreciate the, the hard work of this group, the willingness that you have of working on these issues, and, uh, and look forward to seeing good things in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. This concludes the first panel uh, of today's working group hearing, and we'll call upon the second panelists to work, uh, move their way forward so we can expedite the next panel. Thank you both once again. Charge of the mics. I should, oh, yes, we do. We have live mics. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure we have. Then we're coming if you can't be heard, right? Well, sometimes you have to. No, 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 I know. <laughs> We're, we're going to go ahead and uh, call the Economic Recovery Working Group back to order. And we'd like to say welcome to our second panel. Uh, we're fortunate to have three people here who are extremely well known and respected for their expertise. In, in this panel, from the American Enterprise Institute, we have the excellent economist and current research fellow Alex Brill. Alex also served as Chief Economist to the Committee on Ways and Means and on the staff of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. We also have with us today, I'd like to welcome Grover Norquist, who has been enormously influential in fighting for lower taxes as President of Americans for Tax Reform. Grover also played a key role assisting former Speaker Newt Gingrich in the contract with America. And we have also Bill Beach, the Director of the Center for Data Analysis at the Heritage Foundation, Bill serves as chief numbers cruncher at Heritage, and exceptional research and analysis he provides is enormously helpful uh, to all of us. At this time, I would like to recognize Alex Brill for an opening statement. 
Thank you very much, Congressman Kanner. Uh, and thank you all of the members of this working group. I think it's an, uh, important and excellent that this, uh, that this meeting is being convened and that, and that Republicans are working hard to offer uh, solutions and to work in conjunction with President-elect Obama um, to, to develop components of an economic stimulus proposal. Uh, my opening remarks will be very brief. I really just want to make uh, three simple points. Uh, I'll speak to the state of the economy, uh, principles for stimulus, and close with a comment regarding um, deficits over the long run and the federal debt. Uh, as we heard on the first panel, um, and as many of you commented in your questions, uh, the state of the current economy is quite serious. We've been in recession for over a year and have seen a significant rise in the unemployment rate. Uh, in my view, we may only be halfway through this recession uh, in terms of duration, and uh, it will continue to be a difficult challenge for American workers across the country. Um, as a result of this downturn, there's already been significant stimulus. Uh, monetary stimulus has been in the works for quite some time. And in fact, there's been fiscal stimulus as well uh, at the beginning of last year when, when the first uh, stimulus bill was enacted into law. Uh, we don't know the official numbers yet, but we're expecting that the fourth quarter GDP from last year uh, could be considerably negative. In fact, it could be minus 5%. Uh, and these facts and the facts that the monetary policy have not been effective in turning around the economy yet have led most economists and lawmakers uh, to call for the need for additional and more significant fiscal stimulus. Uh, the process of, uh, that's evolved over the last few weeks and months with regard to developing this package of fiscal stimulus has, in my mind, been a little bit backwards. Uh, we have started by talking about the size of the package and not about the policies underlying those, th th that package, that stimulus. And, and this is, in my view, um, th the wrong way to approach things because, quite simply, not all stimulus is the same. And the policies, the precise policies that are pursued are going to determine whether or not this is a successful effort or whether it is not successful. Uh, as we've seen, the bidding started at $775 billion um, and, and is rising from there perhaps to 825 on this side of the capital, and perhaps by the time we're done, it'll be even larger. Yet we know very little about what will actually be proposed by the Democrats. Uh, with regard to tax policy as a tool for economic stimulus, I would again note not all tax policy is the same. Uh, the single policy that we've heard the most about, and what I believe will be the single largest policy put forward, is a $500 worker tax credit. Uh, while some have attempted to distinguish this policy from a rebate check that was tried last year, it's my view that this, these two policies are virtually identical and that the policy last year failed. One reason that the stimulus checks or that this $500 credit won't work is because when workers receive the credit, they won't spend them. The reason that they didn't spend, in large part, and didn't spend the credits last year is because they were nervous about the economy. Well, that's not the condition today because workers and Americans across the country are not nervous. They're actually quite scared. And I think that the amount of spending that would result from this credit would be even smaller. I'd further note that while this is um, – classified as tax policy, this proposal, it in fact is largely not tax policy, and a large portion of it will in fact be outlays, uh, and this is a result of the fact that the proposal is a refundable credit, and much of it uh, will go to workers who don't pay any federal income tax. Uh, a better strategy, thinking about tax policy stimulus, would be tax relief related to lowering marginal rates, incentives to create uh, reasons for people to hire and reasons for people to enter the workforce. Uh, finally, with regard to the long run, uh, there's a great danger with this stimulus, which is that we're creating permanent uh, increases in spending and permanent increases in the federal debt. And in this regard, uh, any efforts either to curtail long-term spending or even efforts to acknowledge and work towards the problem of the 
uh, unsustainable uh, federal deficit outlook would be welcomed, I think, to markets who themselves are concerned about the rising deficit. Uh, currently, we're looking at a deficit outlook of over a trillion dollars this year, which is before any stimulus is enacted. So um, I think that the, in conclusion, uh, there, it's important to consider smart tax policy, and it's in, very critical to be concerned about the long-run ramifications of any stimulus plan. Thank you very much, Mr. Brill. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize Mr. Beach uh, for opening statements. Uh, thank, you very, thank, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm on. Con thank you very much, Congressman Cantor, uh, members of the working group. The 111th Congress begins its work with a war against an enemy that is intractable as... Can, can you see if your mic is on? Mic on? It's, it's on the, it's it's on the green light there. Okay. A little closer will be. Right. Am I am I am I am I doing a good job now? All right, better? Not not really. Just if you speak right on top of it. All righty, will do. There you go. Um, the 111th Congress begins its work with a war against an enemy that is as in that is as intractable as it is elusive, and with an economic crisis that borders on historic in its severity and complexity. It is clear that the 111th must rise to levels of policy making that few Congresses have had to achieve, and while it does so, it also must be aware of its limitations uh, and, in a sense, operate with a high degree of humility. This is particularly true in the area of economic policy. Uh, the new Congress uh, convened in a rapidly declining economy with an economic trough that is yet in, si in, si uh, yet in sight. Many members may be tempted to pay any price or bear any burden uh, to set the economy right. Indeed, one of the great threats to the economic recovery is just this temptation. Uh, in its eagerness to do bold things, Congress may deepen the recession by damaging the country's ability to borrow needed funds at affordable rates and by impeding the much-needed process of resetting spending and revenue priorities by state and local governments all across the country. The House and the Senate may soon be asked to vote on economic stimulus legislation with a price tag near or exceeding $1 trillion over two years. It may even sooner vote on a resolution to release the second half of TARP funding, or $350 billion. Revenues will be down this year and next by percentages that few active members of this Congress have ever seen. And this Congress will find itself creating more debt more rapidly than any Congress in U.S. history just to meet current, current expenses. We have pr proposed, uh, the Heritage Foundation has, a plan which is at it, sharp variance with the stimulus plan which is in front of you by the, the majority caucus. Uh, our plan calls for an aggressive tax reduction, tax relief measures, dropping the top marginal tax rate for the profits tax, corporate profits tax, from 35 to 25 percent, day one. Uh, dropping the top marginal tax rate for individuals who file through their 1040 and have businesses from that 35 percent to 25 percent day one and making adjustments throughout the income brackets also to provide enormous tax relief, stimulative tax relief. I ran that through my model. Same model the Treasury Department will use, the OMB will use, the Department of Labor will use when the Obama administration takes office on the 20th of this month. That model says that if you do those, those steps, you will protect or create 3 million jobs between now and the end of 2012 fiscal year that you will have a sharp reduction in the length of this recession and a sharp increase in consumer spending and GDP. But if you borrow, you'll be doing the same sort of thing that other countries all around the world are doing. We are not alone in borrowing money to stimulate our economy. Every major economy, including the Asian giants, is in recession. Every government is borrowing or creating money to, and credit at historical levels. Moreover, the need to find lenders will only grow over the next three decades to pay for promised income and health programs for retirees, particularly among those countries that experienced unusually rapid population growth following World War II. It is only last spring that one of the world's leading credit rating agencies put us all on notice by suggesting that continued failure to reform entitlement programs would lead to, to uh, excessive spending and excessive debt and might and might lead that firm uh, to reevaluate U.S. debt into junk bond status. That firm, by the way, 
probably rated all of our mortgages. So it is not a, uh, a minor matter that they're speaking. While many members are working to avoid this financial cal calamity, few have addressed the economic harm and connected it to what we're trying to do now with the, with the stimulus. But if, if you look at current spending needs and what you're being asked to essentially appropriate for, this, for the stimulus, I'd like to throw some numbers out just to contextualize the challenge that you have in front of you. In fiscal year 2008, the deficit stood at roughly $541 billion. Given the slow economy, we expect the deficit to grow to $941 billion, which includes the second TARP funding. If Congress passes the $800 billion two-year stimulus bill, that deficit in FY 2009, my forecast, could stand at $1.31 trillion. And for FY 2010, could be $1.27 trillion. As a percent of GDP, the FY, FY 2009 deficit could be 9.2% of GDP. And in 2010, 8.7% of GDP. I'll conclude with some debt numbers. In 2000, total, in 2000, total federal debt stood at $5.7 trillion, Mr. Chairman, or 58% of GDP. By 2008, that debt had grown to $10 trillion, or 70% of GDP. If Congress borrows the funds for its economic stimulus plan, total debt, that's what you have to pay back, could grow to $13 trillion in this fiscal year, which is 92% of all of the goods and services produced by this economy. And in 2010, total debt could grow to $14 trillion, or 95% of GDP. Uh, I would be worried about that. I would be worried a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beach. Uh, again, I'd like to extend welcome to Mr. Grover Norquist and uh, invite him to make some opening remarks. Certainly. Uh, Senator Reid, uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, and and President-elect Obama have, are fashioning a uh, stimulus spending proposal. In this case, stimulus is a Greek prefix for the, word, for the words, don't look too closely, uh, move now, do things without focusing on them. And I would argue that the idea that uh, the government under Reed, uh, Pelosi, and Obama can reach over and take a dollar out of one side of the economy, either through taxes or debt, move it over to another uh, state and drop it down on the table and announce they've just made us all richer uh, and stimulate the economy is a difficult concept to follow. If the three of them went out with buckets and went to one side of a lake and they each dipped their bucket in the lake and then they wandered around to the other side of the lake and called a press conference and said we now have a program to make the lake deeper uh, and fill it with water and poured their three buckets into the lake, uh, those of you who think that the lake is now deeper than it used to be, has more water in it than it used to be, will follow the logic of stimulus spending. Um, unfortunately, uh, we've done this before in our history. It has never worked in the past. Uh, it has not created permanent growth and permanent uh, jobs. You have before you a history of what has worked in the 1920s. We cut marginal tax rates. We had economic growth. Hoover then raised marginal tax rates and did protectionism and did stimulus spending uh, and managed to turn yet another recession into the Great Depression. Uh, FDR didn't do anything uh, that Hoover hadn't done first uh, and had the same uh, results there. We saw in the 1960s with the Kennedy marginal tax rate reduction, strong real economic growth, and Richard Nixon raised taxes just like Hoover did. Uh, and we ended up with a, a less than successful 1970s. Ronald Reagan reduced marginal tax rates in the 80s. Unfortunately, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush raised taxes, and it wasn't until a Republican House and Senate cut the capital gains tax and moved us back to a lower tax policy that we saw the success of the late uh, 1990s. We also had the three years when you had tax, lower tax cuts, the temporary tax cuts uh, on cap gains and dividends, uh, where you had strong economic growth as soon as control of Congress shifted and everyone knew those tax cuts were going away, we started to see some of those gains in the market uh, evaporate. Uh, I would strongly recommend that any changes on spending uh, th that do get forced through over uh, what, what, what objections can be uh, mustered as, as they structure the House and Senate, is that they be fully transparent. If uh, the people advocating the Pelosi, Reid, uh, Obama, a spending proposal are 
uh, proud of those spending programs and think they will uh, uh, pass muster, they should be on the web. Every program, exactly what they're spending, who's going to get the money, up on the web for 10 working days so the American people can see it. The press can see it. Congress can, and, and senators can read it and take a look at it. Uh, this idea of hurry up and pass something looks like one of those bad movies about guys who sell aluminum siding or, um, uh, or, or try and wrench you uh, <clears throat> places that don't make sense. So uh, getting that. The other is that anyone who votes for a stimulus spending package should have a lifetime ban on going to work for any of the entities that are given money. This should not be the pre-funding uh, for any politician's retirement plans. Uh, and I think that that, that is, is a minimum request that we should make and that if they're actually plan to spend reasonably, they wouldn't object to that. If they don't plan to spend reasonably, then they will object violently to that. So uh, I would argue for uh, permanent uh, tax reduction, uh, but if, if one has to, there are a series of tax cuts that ought to be permanent that if you did them for two years uh, would qualify uh, as having real economic uh, impact. Uh, that is taking full expensing for every uh, business investment in the United States rather than long depreciation schedules. For the next two years, expense everything. I think ultimately we should always expense things to simplify the tax code and to make capital investment less uh, expensive. The other is to do repatriation, which you've already successfully uh, done once, bringing hundreds of millions of dollars back into the United States to be invested here uh, from overseas. And the other is we tend to forget the corporate capital gains tax. We're always focused on the individual capital gains tax. Corporate capital gains tax top rates 35%. We took that to 15% for a two-year period. There's as much as a trillion dollars of, of old investment that would be turned over uh, and made more productive, and you'd actually uh, gain revenue uh, for the government during that two-year period. So those are all sound policies. It ought to be done permanently, but presented over as two-year policies would, would qualify as having real stimulus effect that would create real and permanent jobs and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Norquist. Um, I'm also now going to turn to another citizen question and then ask uh, the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, Spencer Backus, who has another meeting, to also, once this question airs on the screen, to follow up and then have two questions, perhaps, for the panel uh, to respond. So this time, uh, we'll hear from a Mr. Eric Odom of Chicago. Hi, Eric Cantor. This is uh, Eric Odom here, and I'm just doing a video response for your YouTube video. First of all, real quick, I just want to say congratulations on the Twitter stream. I really like the website and direction it's going. I think it's uh, it's pretty cool seeing this stuff happening on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, and appreciate you leading the effort on that side. Uh, I wondered if you support the idea that Heritage Foundation is putting forward, and that is just a completely alternative method of letting us Americans keep our own money to begin with, uh, and I say that as individuals as a, and as a business owner, why not let me keep money to begin with rather than paying the astronomical amount of money into government that I'm currently paying every year? We thank you, Mr. Odom, for that. There's a little bit of a problem with the Chicago cap there, but uh, up, here, up here from some of the members. Uh, turn to the ranking member of the Financial Services Committee uh, from Alabama, Spencer Backus. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I thought Mitt Romney, you, uh, if you all heard him, I thought he walked in and hit a home run. Uh, he talked about the investment pool to capital. And he talked about that we were over leveraged and uh, had too many, uh, the credit bubble burst and the housing bubble. And it depleted capital out of our financial and our banking system. And then it became undercapitalized. And in fact, the reason for capital injections was to recapitalize the banking system. Because you have to have capital to create jobs, prosperity, and growth. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, as unpopular as this may seem, it wasn't to encourage more lending. When in many cases, that had depleted, bad loans had depleted the capital in the banks. Uh, I think you can all tie that to taxes. And uh, Grover, you mentioned the idea of the guy that takes the bucket, dips in the lake, and walks around the lake. I would add to that, as he walks around the lake, there's a hole in the bucket. 
And for some period of time, he takes water out of the lake. Now, that water is capital. And I believe, and I'll get you to comment on but, you know, we, we, as all of you said, what created growth and prosperity in our country and what's not creating it in Japan today is high taxes, which are starving the capital in that country. And, but how can we communicate that message to the American people that they, as individuals and businesses, can use capital more efficiently and effectively and grow that capital better than government? Because apparently what we've gotten down to is a situation where people think the only people that ought to use capital is the government, and that's not a capitalistic system. That's a socialist system. Uh, uh, Congressman, if I could just start the, the answer to that by directing your attention to even a smaller graphic that we brought. We're, we're cutting back on expenses at Heritage, and so I can't afford the larger phone board anymore. Uh, uh, what we're up against is also a story of what worked in the 1930s. Uh, and that story is a powerful story, and it's almost entirely incorrect. Uh, throughout the 1930s, a, a very aggressive, thoughtful government full of smart people tried to increase spending of the government on public infrastructure to reduce unemployment. And I'm displaying for you two, two lines uh, from two different sources of the unemployment rate, one of which suggests that unemployment did not dip below 20 percent from the beginning of the 30s to the end of the 30s, and the other one that says it didn't dip below 14 percent, both very bad numbers. And, I, and then I'd like to also just read you very, very briefly what the Secretary of the Treasury for the 1930s had to say about that at the end of the 1930s when he testified in front of your, your, your brother committee, the House Ways and Means Committee, Henry Morgenthau, there at the beginning. And he said, we have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. And I have just one interest, and if I'm wrong, somebody else can have my job. I want to see this country prosperous. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promises. I say, after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. Thank you. Um, for the other panelists, you can reserve the response to those were questions. We're trying to expedite the uh, time. And I want to call on Ms. Biggert, uh, who from Chicago has been a, a terrific advocate um, for prudent fiscal policy is a senior member of the Financial Services Committee uh, for a question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, in his testimony, uh, Governor Romney mentioned uh, that he, he thought that uh, if we we're going to do a spending that we should include spending for energy research and, and energy uh, infrastructure. Uh, because the ener energy independence is an economic and st uh, strategic imperative. Would you agree with that? Do you think that, uh, that uh, green energy projects have some kind of uh, stimulating effect, or should investments in alternatives uh, be done at a different time? Start with Mr. Norquist. The, the challenge with alternative energies is that they're kind of, by definition, energies that don't exist at present, otherwise they'd be known as energy, or they're energy that's more expensive than the present energy uh, that's available. And in the middle of a difficult economic period, why you'd want to shift over to more expensive energy and force that on the American people it is, is a challenge. Uh, I'm not as excited about energy independence. I don't mind buying stuff from the Mexicans and the Canadians and um, a, a lot of the world that sells the stuff. Other people, it, it's a it's an anti-trade approach, I'm afraid, and I, what I would like us to do is to have more trade with the whole world so that they buy more stuff from uh, us. There are important infrastructure decisions to be made in the United States. The challenge with stimulus, the stimulus package is that they're saying that the programs that they're putting together are ones that the private sector hasn't done in the last 200 years. Chicago hasn't been willing to do with their own money. Illinois hasn't been able to do with its own money. The federal government hasn't been willing to do with its tax money for the last 20 years. But now they've got these programs that have been rejected by the private sector, the city, the state, and the federal government. And these are going to be really important. I, I think we're getting the bottom of the barrel, not the top of the barrel, with some of the projects that are going to be offered to us. We need to be very, very careful. I'm sure there are fine projects out there. I'm, somebody's got one. but. 
the way they're choosing them are getting you from the bottom of the barrel, not the top of the barrel. Well, certainly Illinois has its own problems. Yes, I, I didn't mean to pick on that. Illinois. It's, just, it's where Chicago is. Uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, uh, Beach, do you, um, you know, right now with the, the uh, gasoline prices have gone down, so uh, would this help to stimulate uh, so that we ensure that we're not going to get that spike in the gasoline if we were in – to include some of the energy? Uh, uh, we, we think the answer is yes. Uh, looking very closely at that question and running it through the appropriate economic models to get a sense of whether our guess is right, uh, we found that if you increase domestic production by 2 million barrels per day, uh, and I, that's well within the reach of the United States to do that now, that that would create uh, within the first year that you do so about 230,000 jobs and that increases to about 270,000 jobs three years out. Now, that, those are fairly high-paying jobs, uh, Congresswoman, and those are jobs in the areas which need to be stimulated, in construction, in mining, and in transportation, on top of which it keeps gasoline and energy prices lower than they would otherwise be. Thank you. Thank, th thank you very much uh, to the panel. And we would just like to uh, close this panel with uh, another citizen Comment question. I'm Jeff Emanuel from Atlanta, Georgia. Under the proposals currently described, successful businesses will get no tax cuts. Failing businesses or unsuccessful businesses will get a from the taxpayer. The government would be all in with respect to picking winners and losers in what used to be a free market system here in America. Make tax cuts on those who actually pay them permanent reward businesses and individuals for success rather than rewarding failure and penalizing that success. Thank you very much. Thank you. You said it pretty succinctly. Is there, are there any closing comments any of you would like to make? Look, the idea that some smart collection of politicians could spend your money more wisely than you and your family can uh, is, is a fundamentally elitist idea. You're, these experts uh, to the extent they are experts, don't know your family's needs, they don't know your needs, the idea that they could spend your dollar and your paycheck better than you can, I find uh, not reasonable. Uh, and politicians, uh, present company accepted, uh, tend to like <clears throat> ideas not where you cut everybody's taxes 10 percent across the board because then nobody says thank you. But they really appreciate being able to take money from everybody in the room and giving a uh, sack of money to, to one person who's extremely appreciative uh, for that. And I think that the stimulus package ought not be that kind of pay-to-play operation. It ought to be something that benefits all Americans by reducing the cost of government on their shoulders. Thank you. Uh, 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 oftentimes, economists are, are uh, labeling things with strange terms. And one of the best terms we've come up with is what we call political risk. Uh, and that's when the political sector, uh, through, through legislation and regulation, picks winners and losers. The, the economy of the 1930s tried to recover three times. And the best effort that it made was after the Supreme Court declared the first New Deal unconstitutional. Unemployment rates dropped, the economy came back, and then FDR thought he had a better idea, second New Deal, and the economy goes back into the tank. So, so I think political risk is a real problem, and it generally comes from picking winners and losers. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I know less about the 30s than Mr. Beach does, but I would pick up on a comment that both of them made, um, <clears throat> which has to do uh, with uh, picking winners and losers and a confidence in the economy uh, and the pol comment about political risk. Uh, I think that one of the serious drags at present on our economy is, uh, is a fear by workers and by consumers and by employers. And as this process evolves in a, in a very scattered manner as it's been in the last few weeks and people don't know uh, what, what's in and what's out, people, there is uh, thus far I think virtually no transparency, as Grover referred to, uh, creates a lot of uncertainty. And there's 